Sorry about that. So, um, this is C Cecilia. <laughs> and I'm so glad that she's as patient as I am. <laughs> because this can be very frustrating. You know, this is the thing, chance that you take when you're doing something live. It's not pre-recorded. This is live. And so if there's an opportunity for a glitch, let me tell you, there will be a glitch. Um, so, Cecilia, I'm going to ask you, what brought you to knitting? How did you get involved in knitting to begin with? And what's your background? Um, well, that's a big question. So I um, first learned how to knit, probably it was the late 70s, and I learned from a friend of mine's mother who was a psychiatrist who would knit during the day when she was uh, talking to her patients and would knit beautiful Erin Isle, you know, complicated texture sweaters. So she got me started and I lived in Riverside at the Whoop, sort of breaking up sound. Uh, can people hear me? Yes, yes. Good, okay. Um, so I, um, I was in Riverside, which is a really hot climate, and so I remember in the summers I would close the blinds and you know sit in the air conditioning and pretend it was cold and explore different ideas in knitting. Uh, but I had some really crazy ideas at the time, which one of the ideas was that I wanted to get done with things quickly, so I would always buy a fairly thick yarn. And then I really don't like knit fabric made with thick yarn. So I, it was a Sisyphean experience because I would spend a lot of time knitting things I wasn't very happy with. Uh, but I sort of plugged, it, plugged on but didn't really finish very much. And, and even when I went off to, to college and, and then graduate school in the East Coast, I would always want to go to yarn stores and I would always uh, buy some yarn and kind of explore things. But I was never a very successful knitter, I would say. I never really a finisher. And then in 2000, uh, a young friend wanted to learn how to knit, and after one afternoon of knitting, came back a month later with a pair of socks. Oh and my gosh! That, that oh began gosh. a journey of a small group of us going to stitches events and really rejuvenating our interest in knitting. And I, I began taking lots of classes at events in knitting, and I took Catherine Lowe's workshop in 2004, and really began to connect the dots and understand things I had not understood before about what it takes to make beautiful fabric and even just um, this idea that when you knit the most important thing you're doing is making fabric was a huge light bulb moment for me and so I think that the early 2000s were really when I became a serious knitter and I poured over Elizabeth Zimmerman's books and built a knitting library and really kind of got serious about it. Let's take one little pause. Um, I'm going to try the microphone again okay I'm sorry. To interrupt you. Okay. Um, there's a little uh, like a sound from your microphone. It's like a noise in the background. Do you hear, from me. Yeah, from you. Do you hear where you are? Do you hear anything in your background? No, you're you're so faint. I have my uh, speaker turned almost all the way up so that I can hear you better. Okay, so maybe turn your speaker down. Okay. It's that doesn't, down now. That, okay, that, that, now. Doesn't, that doesn't make the sound go away, so it's not related now to Now I can't hear you at all. Okay, so turn it back up. Turn your back, back up. up. Yeah, that didn't make it go away. Okay, just continue on. We'll just live with it. We're just going to live with it. Okay. okay. That's too bad about the audio quality. I, I could switch to a headset if uh, we want to take another pause. You want to try that? Let's try that. I'm going to have to leave the room for a minute. That's okay. That's okay. So this is my guest. Can you hear me? Frank, let me know if you can hear me. So, um, this is Cecilia Conchiaro, if you missed my introduction. And she wrote, has written two books. She has written the book Sequence Knitting, and she has written the book Making Marvels. And that's what we're going to talk about 
And so if you missed my introduction because you couldn't hear me now, you have a place to start with. I'm so sorry. She's going to try her headphones and see if that helps. Okay, talk, and let's see what you sound like. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Very Is good. Is it better? I think it's better. It's excellent. Good. I can hear you better, too. Yes. Okay, I have to sit closer to the computer because I've got a little cable now, and if I, um, if I move, I'll pull the computer over or I'll yank the microphone out. So, um, so you started knitting. I'm going to recap a little bit. You learned how to knit and you used bulky yarn because you weren't, you wanted to get something made and um, you were toiling along and then you taught a friend how to knit and he came back in a month with a pair of socks. She did. Yeah. She, did. she came back in a month with a pair of socks and was, was very excited about knitting and excited about and you know, Alice Starmore you. and Hebridean and, knitting yeah. and, and all sorts of things of that were fascinating. And it was really a spark that got me going again in a wonderful way. Plus, the thing that we didn't have when I was a teenager in Riverside was we didn't have conferences like Stitches where you could go and be surrounded by many, many other people passionate about knitting and with booth after booth of incredible yarn. I mean, you know, the, the local yarn shop had a very limited selection compared to what you could get in 2000 at a Stitches event. Exactly. And, you know, I had the same issue when I was first knitting is that I was limited by my local yarn store and when I, I didn't even know what these other yarns were until I went to my first Stitches event which was in 2008 and I was blown away by seeing all that yarn. Yeah. And that's when I really had an opportunity to learn about yarn although the first time was not enough it took several times you know to touch it and see it and understand the differences so yes everybody needs to go to a Stitches. I think I think these events, Stitches and 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 Vogue and and all the other uh, similar events, they're so enriching. And to be with other knitters is so energizing. Uh, I just like to say I went to um, uh, Meg Swanson's knitting camp a couple of years ago, and after reading Elizabeth Zimmerman's books and reading all about camp, that was like a bucket list thing to get to do. And you know, sit in a room with 50 other passionate knitters for three days was a joy. Yes. And it's contagious. It is so contagious. It's just like whenever I do these interviews and meeting somebody else who is lives, eats, and sleeps knitting like I do, you know, it, you just, it gives you so much um, stimulation that you need, stimulation in an area that you love. And sometimes external stimulation really helps internal stimulation a lot. Yeah. So, so then you so you took Meg Swanson's class, you took uh, Catherine Lowe's class. So now you're getting into much more advanced knitting. Yeah, but I still um, I still don't think I was a very productive or successful knitter. Um, but I I was interested in it, you know. But I I was making very simple things because when I would when I would make more complicated things like a sweater, they just never were successful and uh, you know at this point I can look back and I can understand all the mistakes I made <laughs> but I still wasn't connecting all the dots to be a successful knitter and, and it was really my sequence knitting journey that um, began to bring all these ideas together and helped me become what I think of as a more more successful knitter. So what, uh, what made you even what started clicking in your mind to thinking about sequence knitting? Yeah so I um, so the, the second picture I sent you mm -hmm. um, the is, is really the, the kind of the aha moment uh, piece. So I had been making the Jared Flood's Noro striped scarves using uh, two balls of Noro, swapping the color every two rows, and loved watching the color change. And this scarf was um, Stephanie Pearl McPhee's one row hand spun scarf. And this is made in Lisa Seuss's hand spun merino that I had bought at Stitches West. And... I had wanted to change up from the Noro striped scarves and so I found this pattern and I was working full time and I was traveling heavily working in high tech and uh, I made this scarf and it was magical. It wasn't ribbing. It was the same on both sides. It was a one row pattern so it was really easy to knit. And this is the 
the really the piece where I began experimenting with variations of it that led to what ultimately became sequence knitting. But the thing that the thing that um, what happened after Catherine's class, and I think um, the swatching for sequence knitting also did was, you know, when you're making swatches, you're making just little squares of fabric, and all of the things that matter, like how beautiful is your cast on, how beautiful are your edges, uh, all these little details are really, really important to the whole thing looking nice. And I think part of why I wasn't successful is I had been raised by a mother who was extremely keyed into whether or not things were well made. I mean, we would go to this, you know, we would go to a department store, we would look at sweaters, and she would quickly identify the ones that had been sewn on a machine versus ones that had been fully fashioned. And so I, I think my level of perfectionism and expectation of what beautiful knitting had to be was pretty close to Catherine Lowe level, <laughs> which, which made it hard as a beginner to get to that goal. Your expectations right. for yourself were too great. Well, or I don't know if they were too great, but they were high. And I think it just took me a long time before I learned the things that are important to, to get to get to that level. And I was, for a long time, way too focused on speed. I told you about using bulky yarn and wanting to knit with bulky yarn because you got done faster, but then not liking knit fabric made from bulky yarn. The other thing I tried to do is I tried to, to knit continental style. I took several classes on knitting continental, and I spent... Uh, a year trying to knit continental thinking it would make me faster but I've always been a thrower and the switching process was actually not I really was, wasn't that much faster knitting continental but my tension wasn't very good and so I've now gone back to throwing in a very deliberate way and really focused on tension you know and and the you know one of the one of the most important things in knitting maybe the most important thing in knitting is being able to make consistent loops with two sticks and um you know, just your know, tension so much more important than speed. And if your tension looks good, you don't have to rip back, you know, and fix things. So I, I think uh, being making swatches really helps. Maybe hundreds of swatches. Um, one person asked, they said, what is, this is, um, I'll put it over on the screen. What is sequence knitting? Sequence knitting is taking a sequence of stitches like Knit 3 Pearl 1, which is what Stephanie Pearl McPhee's scarf was made from, and repeating that sequence of stitches over and over and over again according to some rule. And depending on the sequence and depending on the rule, you will build up a textured fabric. And it's not new. I didn't invent it. The, the most, I mean, there's some very common stitch patterns that are sequence knitting like uh, ribbing, all, you know, knit two, purl two, knit three, purl three, ribbing. Those are all sequence knitting because you're repeating a sequence over and over again to create a fabric. Um, you know, seed stitch is um, the simplest broken garter pattern and broken garter patterns are sequence knitting. So it's not new, but I think what, what I did is I just took it to the extreme of I'm going to repeat this sequence and I'm going to repeat it in this way and I'm going to see what happens. And sometimes you get some really amazing and interesting things. And if you show that next picture of the hats, I'll, I'll, um, I'll tell you, I'll show you what I mean. Oops. So this is, oh, go back one. So this is a series of hats called the Sarah hats. And if you look at the one on the top, you can see that it's just a ribbing watch cap. And the ribbing in this case is knit two, purl two twice, and knit one, purl one twice. So you can even see that in the ribbing if you look at it. So if you make, if you take any um, sequence of stitches, any knit purl sequence of stitches, and you cast on an even multiple, meaning uh, in this case, knit, knit two, purl two twice, and knit one, purl one twice is 12 stitches. You cast on a multiple of 12, and you join in the round, you'll get some kind of ribbing. So that's the ribbing hat. But if you add just one stitch, and then you repeat that sequence of stitches again and again in the round, you'll get a swirl. And the hat on the bottom left is the swirl. And so the only difference between that hat and the one above is adding one stitch. Wow. So that's, that's an example of sequence knitting where by choosing your stitch count and choosing your rule, you change the way the stitches line up from row to row and you build up these, I call them self-aligned textures. Well, that's the same change that you would see between knit one, purl one ribbing and seed stitch. You're just shifting yes. one stitch. Yes, 
In yes. fact, often in my classes, you know, when, when people all look at me like, wow, that's so amazing. Now, that's what I say is think about think about one by one ribbing and seed stitch. It's exactly the same thing. And if you want to think about gauge and, and different fabrics, you know, can you think of two fabrics more divergent than one by one ribbing and seed stitch? Right. They're completely different fabrics and they have different properties. The fabrics have different properties. But it's the same sequence and they're both one row patterns or in the round patterns. So the only difference between the two is casting on one more stitch. Right. Amazing. So do you want to come back to you or do you want to talk more about the hats? Well, so just, so just um, uh, I think another point here is so each of the hats is one stitch different than the next. Oh, so it and goes so as, to this hat, then this hat. And then I think you go to the back one. Then and this then, one. Well, the order, I think, is, I think that one that you're on right now, that one there, that's mm -hmm. actually the last of the set because there's six unique textures. Uh -huh. And that's, um, so that's on a multiple of 12 plus six, which I think of as kind of the halfway point because um, you can think of 12 plus or minus one, 12 plus or minus two, 12 right. plus or minus three. So 12 plus or minus six is the same stitch count. So what would oh. happen here is if, if you kept adding stitches, you would get mirror images. But that one that you were pointing at is the one that's at the halfway point. Right. And if so, you look at that, you can see that it looks more regular than the others. It looks in a way simpler than the others, almost like a type of a ribbing again. Yes. So you can almost correlate this with pooled, planned pooling. It's related because planned pooling is yarn that's been dyed with a regular distance, regular length of yarn on a on a repetitive in a repetitive way, and your the width of your knitting and the gauge of your knitting interacts with that yarn length to have the colors overlap in some predictable way. Yes, it's, and it's by very shifting analogous. one stitch, you can completely change the pool design that's created. It doesn't even look, right. resemble the previous design at all just by shifting one stitch. Yeah, it's a good analogy. Yeah, very interesting. Okay, continue on. Well, continue on with what was I saying? <laughs> so, you, so you've started your sequence knitting, and, you know, one of the things that I liked about the sequence knitting is when I saw it, the first thing I thought is, what if I add more colors? Yeah. I really like the idea of adding more colors. Yeah. Well, so I think of sequence knitting as a framework for making fabric. I mean, it's a stitch pattern. And so you fill it in with your choice of yarn, your choice of gauge, the colors and you know, textures of the yarn, but you're filling it, that all into a framework. So you can do multicolored pieces. And I didn't give you a photo, but there's a piece called Robson in the book sequence knitting. I can hold the page up where um, I really, I think, kind of showed how you can use sequence knitting as a palette for color. Right. Can people see that? Yes. That's so beautiful. This was, a, this was an example of taking a stitch pattern. There are a couple other versions of it in the book, but here there were... Um, approximately 50 little balls of color and they were just ordered from uh, white to black and knit following the rules and you know when you do that you have enough color something good will happen yes yes um, so we were talking uh, earlier that it's it create it, you're, what you're doing is creating a fabric and a textured fabric and most of these fabrics in fact all of them that I can see in your book are going to lay fairly flat because they have about an equal number of knits and purls. Well, it's not the equal number of knits and purls. Um, what makes them lay flat is you don't do a purl back. If you look at in the history of knitting, and I think because so much knitting was um, aimed at garment creation where, where reversibility is not important, you know, so many stitch patterns have a purl back in them. And whenever you have a purl back on the even rows, you're inherently going to break reversibility. In sequence get... knitting, you do the same thing on both the, the front right. side row and the back side row. And that's why the, the fabrics most that, of the time that would the same give on you an sides. equal number of transitions between knits and purls. So it's those transitions between the knits and purls that cause the fabric to lay flat. Yeah. Yes. And so yeah. these and you are can find actually... a few oddball ones that skew, but not very many. Yeah, it's also very much like weaving, like creating a woven fabric. It's um, 
So it's create and woven fabrics are very small repetitions of stitch patterns that create complex designs when you look at them overall. So this is a lot like that also, which again, I think of color, you know, I, I, that's how my brain goes. I just like color, uh, changing colors and seeing the transitions. Also, when you're changing colors, because there's knits and pearls and knits and pearls, you're going to get those bicolored pearls, which is going to uh, blend the colors across. It's not going to be a stripe in your work. There's no stripes in this in when you make a color change. Well, yeah, the, the stripes have a dither on them. From right, because there's the no straight knit rows or straight pearl rows. None of the rows do that. So it's going to have those little bicolored pearls, which um, shifts the color up and down, makes it sparkly across there. So after you wrote this book, how did your life change? Well, it changed a lot. Um, so I, I, um, I wrote the book after a few years of exploring the idea and many, many, many swatches and a lot of research and, and concluding that, you know, I thought that the idea was so simple that I thought I could find a book about it. And I went on a long journey to try and find a book about it because I was trying to understand it better. And the more I looked at the knitting books I could get my hands on, the more I realized that the idea hadn't been written about. And you know, I, I've spent my entire life in, in science and in science your, or in technology and your, your whole dream in science and technology is to have an aha moment that's meaningful. And I that's felt new, like that I had, someone else hasn't done before, which is hard. Well, I think like a lot of really great aha moments, it's a simple idea. And, the, you know, the, I think about the woman who figured out that the, you know, the continents all fit together and have come apart over over millennia you know that that's another very simple idea that's kind of a duh when you look at the world map and I felt like this was another really simple idea that I had been just gifted with and I, I felt maybe almost a duty to um, document it so that other people could use it and then I had to figure out how do you you know how do you share the information because you can share the information today in so many different ways but really if you want to take a complicated idea and you want to explain it in a coherent way, I think a book is still our most perfect medium for explaining something in a coherent way. And I'm, I'm, I'm also maybe a little bit old fashioned that, you know, even though I had the very first kind of iPad there was, and even though I live in Silicon Valley, I, I still think a book is um, maybe the most important medium we have. So I, decided to make a book about sequence knitting and I did it in my spare time while I was working. And when I, when it was about the time to come out, my company was going through quite a bit of upheaval and I said, please, um, you know, give me a package, let me go. And I, um, left, I left high tech and I spent six months just jumping into the knitting world. And, uh, you know, that was right around the time I met you at Madrona and, uh, spent about six months, you know, promoting the book and starting to teach my first knitting classes and really talk to knitters about this in public. Cause I had been, um, you know, doing it in a vacuum, doing it in a bubble, if you will. And then the fall of that year, that was 2015. I, I took a high tech, high tech job with a different company that I worked for for a few years and then ultimately decided I really wanted to think more about textiles and knitting and left off the cliff. And now I'm starting to think about the next book. <laughs> wow. So, um, you know, a couple of weekends ago, I interviewed June Hemans Hyatt and her story is similar in that she was working in a vacuum for quite some time. It was just her and her research and that she really even thought that her book didn't go over very well, you know, after all those years of work. And she said she was shocked when she got on and saw that the resale value of her book was $1,200. You know, I, I bought a, a used copy of her first edition for $350 when I was on that quest for... I paid $200 oh. for mine, you yeah. know, and I felt uh, lucky to get it at that because they were few and far be... He, I had to have a, keep my thing on there to searching for when somebody put one up for sale, you know. So, so. I, I think it's important though to think about the, there's a big benefit to working in a bubble or working in a vacuum, which is focus. And when you're really focused, you can think and you can create ideas and you can play with ideas and you don't have to defend them because it's just you there 
that's the benefit. The, the downside is that you may not be explaining things very clearly because you don't have someone else to explain them to. Uh, you may be going down a rabbit hole that doesn't make sense. And I, I think there's some balance there that's ideal. So I think the pure bubble is not perfect by itself, but it's also helpful to spend time in a bubble to actually get stuff done. And that well, you, the thing you immerse I think about yourself. Is, what, it, you immerse yourself. It's like jumping in the ocean, just jumping in, not stepping in and getting used to the cold water. You just jumped in all the way and immersed yourself in it for a while. Yeah, that's right. But uh, the, the, thing you, the thing you want, though, I mean, the reason why you write a book is you want people to read the book. You want people to use the ideas in the book. You know, you're, you're not trying to hold the ideas close. You're actually trying to do just the opposite. You're trying to give them out to the world. And you want people to take the things that you write down, not not to replicate them, but as a starting point for their own work and their own ideas. And you want these ideas to be incorporated in. And I think June, I'm sure, feels the same way about all of the wonderful things in her book. And what I feel now is it's important to have a little bit of balance there and get input from people in the knitting world who are influencers so that when your book comes out, you've got some people there who are going to help you talk about it and help the world get excited about it because um, that's what you want. And and so another way to say it is I think marketing a book, especially if you're self-published, is an enormous challenge. Right. And, and so having people who are who know you and who are aware of what you're doing is incredibly important and helpful to to getting a book out into the world. So um, what you were just talking about, um, you're not it's not proprietary information. It's not information you're trying to hold close. It's not like, oh, look what I did. I figured this out. Look at me. It's more like. Look what you can do. Yeah. Try this out. And so if people want to use these stitch patterns in their patterns that they want to publish, that's okay, right? Yeah, it's a stitch dictionary, right? Yes, I mean, it's you, a stitch you, it dictionary. It should be a basis for ideas. And, and people have done sequence knitting in some patterns. And, yeah. I, and it's I certainly okay more. to say that they got it from your book. Yeah, I think that that's something that I really learned from Elizabeth Zimmerman and Meg Swanson, and I think Catherine Lowe is also quite sensitive about it. I think it's really important in knitting to recognize the people whose shoulders we stand upon. And I, you know, it's it's hard because nomenclature and documentation in knitting is terrible. Knitting's always been a, a kind of a lower craft, you know, compared to. Uh, I think weaving, which has been, a, or tapestry work, tapestry right. probably been the highest craft where, you know, kings have their own tapestry shops making them fabulous tapestries hanging in museums. But um, it's really hard to research knitting. But if you are getting your ideas from somebody else, I think it's very, it's, it's somewhere between good manners and the right thing to do to try and recognize that. And, exactly. And I, I think there needs to be more of that in knitting. And when people are new to the craft, you know, to go, learn right. something about the history. For example, um, I'm a member of the Knitting Guild Association and they put out a publication called Cast On Magazine for their members. And what I really like about the, and I've written many articles for them, one of the things I like about their articles that you find in some magazines but not all, is that they give references at the end of the article. Yeah. Because for me, I love research. So when I read the article, I immediately go to see if I have those references, and I read those too. Because I want to get my own interpretation. Do you know what I mean? It's like they're regurgitating the food for me, but I'd really like to go to the main source of the food and see what that person had to say. So I really like it when it's linked from person to person to person like that. Giving credit to the previous person. I like that. Um, I was at Sock Summit in 2008 that Stephanie Pearl McPhee and Tina Newton put on. And at the end, they had a panel, um, and you could step up to the microphone and ask questions of people on the panel. And somebody asked Barbara Walker if it was okay to use the stitches from her stitch dictionary in their patterns. And she said, yes. She goes, I didn't invent those stitches. It's a stitch dictionary, and you can use them. I mean, and a lot of people had questions about that, and you could certainly say that you got it out of Barbara Walker's book, blah, 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 page, whatever. You know, that's okay to do that, but it's also okay to use it. Now, there's a really good question over here 
uh, from uh, two, two really good questions. One's from Fatima, and she says, um, I knit some of your scarves from your book. Robson was one of those. How do you carry changing the yarn up the edge so neat? I could not. Uh, great question. This is something I talk about in my classes. So first of all, I believe in keeping it simple. So it's just usually I just always bring the old yarn below and up around in front of the new very consistently. But the main thing I do is something I call primping my knitting. And this goes back to why my knitting in the early days was terrible, why my knitting now is better. Before I begin a row, I, I just I pull my knitting down on the needle so that I set the stitches on the needle. And when I especially when I'm changing yarn, I really tug firmly on it. And I'm very, very careful to make sure that there is enough yarn that um, I'm not making the side of the fabric curve. Right. So I have a video on that, how to change um, yarn at the edges of your knitting. The thing is, is when you go to bring that new yarn up, you're going to accidentally pull the stitch tight that it was in in the previous row and that constricts the edge and it makes the edge look uneven so you really have to some people suggest making a yarn over before you start but i just say be aware like you're saying you pull down on it be aware of that stitch and when you go to pull the yarn up to work the next row with it that you're not constricting the stitch it's coming from below Yes, and I, I also, um, I've tried doing the yarn over approach, which is fine. My problem is I forget to I drop it on the it. next row. So I you have to remember it. to drop it on the next row. But I've had a sample knitter make a piece for me where she did that, and her and it hung perfectly. But I, I, I primp the knitting, and then I'm very mindful of the amount of yarn there, and I still pull probably double the yarn through on that first stitch, and then I just knit the second stitch without a thought, and, and that second stitch takes up some of the slack, but I've never, I've never been able to make a color change side be too loose. I've never, ever been able to make it too loose. So throw, I just throw much more yarn in there than feels comfortable in the moment to have right. that edge hang right. And when you get it right, you hold the knitting up and it will hang straight. Yeah, it one side won't, won't be pulled up. It, exactly. And, Another thing that I've seen people do is to work the first stitch normal, make the yarn over for the second stitch, and then work on, because when you come back, it's easier to see that it's a yarn over and you can drop it. Because yep. I'm like you, if I make a yarn over at the beginning, when I come back, I, I work into the yarn over. And then, I, and, and then I go, oh my God, and then I've got it, you know, and usually I don't catch it till like the next row. So yep. it, it creates issues for me. There was another question up here that was so good. And I, I'm going to try to get as much of these questions as I can in here. Um, this is from Trevster. Question, are you thinking about applications for the sequence pattern? Shaping can be difficult, but the fabrics are so beautiful for garments. And so he's talking about shaping in these. But then that comes back to something you said your mother looked for full fashioned. So there's two kinds of shaping. And it depends on what you want your fabric to look like. I'm giving my opinion, then you can give yours. Okay, one is blended, where the shaping crosses across the fabric. And the other is full fashion, where the shaping goes to the edges of the fabric. So it depends on what you want it to look like around the neck and the armholes and stuff like that, if you want it. So what's your opinion? <laughs> so, so one of the things I did not write about in the book sequence knitting, but... Uh, I think uh, with hindsight, and if I hadn't written it in a bubble, I would have written about it, and I, I will write about it in the future, is this concept, I call them cheat sheets. But if you think about, um, imagine you were trying to make a rectangle of sequence knitting with a fairly complicated stitch pattern, and maybe a complicated rule like serpentine method where the sequence is following the path of the yarn, and you can get really complicated, beautiful textures but it's kind of a bear to knit and it would be very difficult to incorporate that into like a uh, set in sleeve. So what I do now is I, um, I actually do something that's a hybrid between the simple language of sequence knitting and row by row instruction where I write down how each row begins and how the row ends. And then I can begin the row and then run the sequence across the row as soon as I'm past that little fragment of a sequence at the beginning. I can just run the sequence across the row. If I were going to do a sleeve cap, I would take Excel and I would make a chart and I would fill, fill the texture into the 
shape of the sleeve cap that I wanted. And then row by row, I could read the chart and see how does each row begin. And then once I'm into that, I just run the sequence across the rest of the row. So I would fill in that texture with that hybrid method. And right. I would use the chart and sequence knitting in Excel to, to create the chart just exactly the right shape for what I wanted to do. And I would make the, the pieces just you know, fully fashioned the way I would, you know, just the way I would want them. Charles is giving you a compliment, Charles Gandy. He says, I, he says, I love your book. My best compliment is that I wish I had written it myself. <laughs> Thank you for a beautiful That's book. Very kind. Thank you, Charles. <laughs> so um, what you were talking about, the shaping there, is very similar to what people do in lace uh, and others where they have a multiple and then they have the stitches ahead, then they have their multiple line, the line at the edge of the dis pattern, the other line at the end of the pattern, and then they have the stitches that finish it off. Right. So same concept. Right, and I, you know, I, was, um, I was talking with the um, San Francisco Textile Arts Council a few days ago, and, it, and someone asked the question there about, you know, do you ever cut knit fabric? And I'm like, no, I, I normally you don't because the whole benefit of knitting and the fact that knitting is so slow loop by loop is that you can make the pieces exactly the shape you want them for the purpose you're designing them for. And I've I really at this point for my own knitting believe very much that you need to um, map out for anything complicated. You need to map out on a grid on a, you know, in a graph paper. You need to map out stitch for stitch exactly what you're going to knit. And then the process can become very simple, but going through that exercise of mapping it out stitch for stitch is the key to exactly. seeing where you're going and making it transparent. Now, you could uh, do sticking in this, but like what I would do, because I've done sticking and stranded knitting. You can stick stranded knitting. That's not fair aisle. You can stick any fabric. You just have to create an area where you're going to cut. So like, let's say you were knitting a, a Gansey in the round using this one of these uh, sequence knittings you would just create a steak area you would create bridge stitches that have no design in them and that's where you're going to cut so they yes. would fold back yes yeah and if, if you um if you ever want to do sequence knitting in the round whether it's for the top of a foot in a sock with a stockinette pad under your foot or if it were to knit the body of a sweater in the round with a steak when you're knitting in the round, if you just pretend that the that part that's not the sequence knitting isn't there, and just jump the sequence over that gap, right? You'll, the sequence will stay in pattern. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Very so cool. you can certainly do that, and there's there's certainly nothing wrong with doing that. And the other thing you can do with sequence knitting in the round using the spiral method is you can use those um, texture patterns as color patterns. And instead of doing knit pearl, you can do color A, color B. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's very cool. Oh, that's very interesting. I hadn't, that's, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> so let's talk about, so then you, that book went out, and then you start thinking about writing another book. Oh, by the way, do you have all your swatches? Do you save all your swatches from your books? Do you have boxes of swatches? So the, the swatches from Sequence Knitting are now gone. Um, the swatches from Making Marls, I still have the boxes of the swatches from Making Marls, but they'll go relatively soon. And then um, I have boxes of future work of swatches. <laughs> but, but the swatches have a purpose, and I don't have that much space that I, I, I need to move things out to make room for a new thing. So I don't save things forever. Um, so, you know... A lot of people don't like to swatch, or even just for gauge, they don't like to swatch. I'm a swatcher. I not only swatch for gauge, but I try everything on a swatch before I try it on my garment. You know? I think the, the, the secret to becoming good at knitting is to become a lover of making swatches. Yes. And I actually, for the classes I teach, I get really involved in making the swatches for my classes. I almost like that better than knitting big pieces. Because each one is an entity unto itself, and I get that self-gratification. You know, it's yep. kind of like when you mow the lawn and you can sit back and, oh, look how beautiful it looks. You know, I finish a swatch. I can finish a little swatch in under an hour and get the, the instant gratification, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's, so. there's, just, there's, just no, there's just no way around it. it it's, um, it's like if you're an engineer building a complicated machine, you're going to build 
prototypes of, of subsystems. You're going to build small prototypes to make sure your ideas work. Right. It's the same thing in knitting. You, you need these small prototypes to make sure that your idea is going to look the way you think it's going to look, that the fabric is going to feel the way you want it to feel, that you can predict gauge. I mean, there's just no way around it. Right. And, and I think once you give into that, once you let go and give yourself into that, it's it's transformative. I mean, it, it was really the, the thing that changed my knitting. It and it's everything. addicting. It is totally addicting. Very, very addicting because you can try something out really quickly and see the results. Whereas if you wait to try it on your sweater, you've got to knit a whole sweater first. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so. That's right. That's right. It's a false economy to think you can skip that step. Yes. Okay, so let's talk about the next book. How did that come about? So show the next photo. Okay. So there's a piece in sequence knitting called Nebraska Winter, and it was knit in a multicolored mohair yarn. And I don't mean silk mohair, but mohair yarn and a blue face luster every two rows. And it's a beautiful stitch pattern that makes a box pleat. But I was unhappy with the fabric because here I am in Sunnyvale, where it's 97 degrees today and sitting in the air conditioning, thank goodness. But um, um, it's never cold enough in Sunnyvale to wear fabric that warm but the other thing about that fabric is that mo mohair yarn is dense. If, if you've ever just picked up mohair yarn, it's, it's, heavy. it's, it's physically heavy compared yes. to wool. And um, this piece of fabric is just he heavy, physically heavy. And I don't like wearing anything physically heavy. You know, to me, if I could live in cashmere and down, you know, yeah. cotton, I, that, that's like fine for the rest of my life. And so I, I was unhappy with this piece, and I really wanted to reinvent it. And I had become a little bit addicted to Color Mart. And you can see behind me that cupboard that's full of my uh, Color Mart collection. Uh, and Color Mart is a company in England that sells the scraps from the cashmere industry in Scotland and Italy. And the cashmere for machine knitting is typically, you know, almost a heavy thread. Wow. You know, mm -hmm. Too thin for hand knitting. But if you hold four strands together, it makes fingering weight or sport weight. Exactly. And so this is... a. Uh, um, my first piece made from that color mart yarn and I wound, I wound the, the balls to be moral, to be, um, gradient balls. So I started with uh, four strands of medium gray and I wound for a while and then I swapped out one of the strands to become lighter and I made two gradient balls, one from medium gray to light gray and one from light gray to white. And this is that same Nebraska winter piece knit every two rows with those two gradient balls. But instead of being built like typical gradient balls that are dyed with, you know, uh, dyed in a panel and deconstructed, right. this was all built with marls. So this was the first kind of marl piece I made. And you can see one of the things that's unique about marls is when one of the strands changes, like you can see right in the middle there, the color changes pretty dramatically. Mm -hmm. And that's because you know, 25% of that strand went from dark to light and all of a sudden it became quite a different color. So marls have a different look to them. But this was the first um, idea that I could control the color of the fabric by breaking strands and changing strands. And it was by playing with these four strand marls. And it just uh, became, it just began to creep into more and more pieces and ultimately, you know, you start thinking about how, how how does this work and why does this work and what can I do with it? And at some point it became the thing I had the most to say about next. So um, the there's another question from 77 Vega Lira. She says, what are marls? A marl is, historically and most typically, a marl is a yarn that's got two strands plied together that are different colors. So if you go to the yarn store to buy a marled yarn, you can find multiple examples of this. That's the most typical example of what a marled yarn is. Sometimes they're called twist yarns. In Denmark, they're called melange yarns. But I use the word marl more broadly to say I could use that commercially made marled yarn, or I could just take two different balls of yarn and hold the strands together while I knit and create my own marl. Or if you like this one, if you have four strands, you can slowly transition. So it's a, right. a slow color change, but still 
And then you, in your, well, keep going, because in your book you discuss different ways of putting the yarns together for marls and the different, if you show the different effects. So let's show your book. Right. Do you mind? I'm going to sure. sh skip over to that and then we'll come back to here. There's I got my, the picture here. My, uh, there's my, whoop. Yes. You can see it says cover dummy on the front. That, uh, this was the very first book. Uh, and it has some flawed pages in it because they didn't use the real pages because this was just to verify that the cover was done correctly. But uh, this is uh, the new book. You know what I like about it? I like this texture here. Thank you. Yeah, I did too. I wanted to do the entire book in fabric and then have a book jacket. Yeah. And I, I, I talked to a few people in the book industry and they said, don't do that. You're out of your mind. And they proposed this is a compromise where you still have that nice feel of the cloth with your hand, yes. but you don't, you don't need to do a book jacket because it's hard to keep book jackets nice in stores. And it's actually really kind of cool because it goes with your sequence knitting. It's a change of texture yeah, and, and color. So it's really, uh, when I picked it up the first time, I, I just, my hand really noticed that. I really liked it. Good. <laughs> Yeah, and, it, and this book was, was, was made by a company in Germany that makes art books. So they really, they did a beautiful, it beautiful book. It is a gorgeous book, it. book. It's beautiful. And you really go into a lot of detail about yarns and different uh, uh, weights of yarn and putting different weights together and balancing them. I mean, there is a ton of useful information in here that has nothing to do with morals but it has to do a lot to do with knitting. It's a very good resource book, even if you're not making marls, because the way you discuss combining yarns together and combining different textures of yarn together, different um, fibers together, you go through all of that. You go through every single possibility of com combining yarns together. And I have to say, um, it's really infused with ideas from Catherine Lowe, who's been a huge influence on me. And June Hyatt's book, um, you know, and in June Hyatt's book, I was just going back and looking at her chapter on color, and she talks about strands together as her first um, way of way working with color. But but kind of like with sequence knitting, emarls have been around for forever. I certainly didn't invent them. They're they're kind of all around us right now. They're really popular. But you know, if you go back and look at like Monsi Stanley's book or or any of the older books, you just you know nobody. People kind of talk about them like they're even the lowest of the color work, you know. Um, you know, if you think about like Fair Isle is or well, it's really it's not kind of mentioned in any color work books either. You know, like um, I have Margaret Radcliffe's book here. I don't think she talks about marls in there. She talks about it obliquely, yes, but not as a thing. Right. Yeah, right. But it's a thing. It's a thing, and it's a wonderful technique, but that that is incredibly powerful. I mean, this is tip of the iceberg. Yes. You know? of what you can do with it. Yes. And, and your book, your book is not a pattern book, although you could knit the things in your book. Your book is more about how to take your ideas, Cecilia's ideas, and transform them into your own work, and how to learn about this, and how you can manipulate your own fibers, how you can manipulate your own colors, use the sequence knitting type stitches, and different shapes. You give alternatives for all different types of shapes of fabric, you know? I mean, it's really, um, it's really a good resource book, not just for morals. It's, I'm glad Thank it's you. in my library. I like it a lot. Good. And you know, it's hard finding information about uh, uh, different varieties of yarns and mixing them together. Uh, many of the traditional learn how to knit books, Vogue Knitting, and some of the other books, they all have a section in the beginning about fiber. They all do, but none, and some of them talk about fiber substitution, but you're not talking about fiber substitution. You're talking about creating a new fiber by mixing other fibers together. Yeah. And using yeah. the attributes of the fibers. I think that the most important thing is the length per weight. So I, meters per hundred grams is if you, if you always figure out what that is and categorized how you think about yarn that way it makes your life so simple that's and, what i do i have worsted weight and fingering weight memorized i know the ranges that they should be so everything else i can do in relationship to those so that i know but you also tell how to figure out how much yarn you're going to need for your project in here 
And a lot of yeah. people don't talk about that either. Even people who tell you how to create your own designs often don't discuss how do you figure out how much yarn are you going to need. I often don't discuss yeah. that. That's left out. It's like assume, either you assume that you know how to do it or they just forgot and left it out. You know, and, uh, most people don't know how to figure out their yardage for a project in advance because they've knit from patterns and the pattern always tells you how much you need. So you've never had to stop and think, how would I figure that out? You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I tried to write the patterns in a, I mean, I, I tried to highlight yarns that I really like in terms of what I use, but I also tried to write the patterns in a way that yarn substitution would be fairly straightforward. Right. So um, Duca Nico has a comment. He says, I enjoyed marling different colors at Stephen B's color class today. He and I took both took a color class as well. A whole bunch of my friends did from Stephen B this morning. And we oh. were talking about that. And I told them in the class that I was going to be doing this this afternoon because that's what Stephen does is he, he, he often uses two strands at the same time. And he was talking about the same thing that you're talking about in this scarf here. That one, the light color is going through the whole thing. Or up to, uh, the light color actually goes up to here. And well, then you, they're both, then they're, you start they're both with, moral balls yeah. in this case. They're both moving. Yes. But the light color, what, one is consistently lighter than the other. Right, so it's how one... Uh, plays with the other, how the two colors play together and what type of result you get. So yeah, do, do you want right. to look at some more of your slides? Left, so it looks like a solid. Right. Do you want to look at the next slide? Oh, sure. Okay. So this was a really important piece. Whoops, this I'm is, sorry. Whoop, oh, sorry. Okay. Which one? Which this one, one right was the here. next one? This one. Uh, this one. Okay. So this piece is knit in a yarn from England by made by John Arbin. And it is a, a beautiful um, British long wool called uh, Devonia. And it comes in these really curious colors that were inspired. They, um, John and his wife took a trip to France and they saw an exhibit by a French tapestry artist. And I believe they were inspired by the colors of those mid I think they were mid-century French tapestries. And they came back and they made a new yarn and they named it uh, Devonia. And they chose the colors from that. But the colors are really different colors than you would normally see. And I had, I had the yarn, and I knew I wanted to make this poncho, which was uh, it's a simple sequence knitting pattern, but it's inspired by that church mouse poncho that is just a you know, beautiful piece of folded stockinette with a hole in the top. So a very simple, wearable piece. Um, but I had four colors, which makes six marls, and I could not decide how to order the marls. And I, I stewed about this for, I was maybe really in the process really for months. And this was the piece where, I first made micro swatches and a micro swatch is just um, you know, cast on six stitches, knit four rows of stockinette and cast off. So you basically make a postage stamp piece of marled fabric. But I, um, I finally resorted to that because I had been knitting little strips of marl sequences in terms of how I wanted to, um, to order things. But the problem with the little strips is they're already kind of cast and it turns out that there's like 24 combinations that you could have, to, you would have to knit to see them all, which becomes prohibitive at some point. So this piece was really important because this was the piece that drove me to making micro swatches, which I now think is a really, really great way to prototype how colors are going to mix. And so yes. I knit these little micro swatches and I was able to push them around on a table over a period of a couple weeks and noodle over them without any hurry and then decide what order the piece was going to be worked in. There's some yeah. micro swatches. Yeah. And, you, and um, they're, they're just, again, they're just, um, you know, again, uh, 24 stitches, right? You cast on six, knit four rows of stockinette and bind off. But this idea of um, being able to see how the colors blend is really important in marls. And if you, um, if you twist the yarns together like a little barber pole, like you'll sometimes see Fair Isle colorists do, you see the same thing. You see the same effect. The problem is when you let go, the yarns fly apart. And the thing I like about this is that it, it persists. So speak about that, the twisting together. So you, there's two ways you can hold two yarns together, probably more than two ways. But you can just pull one from one ball and another from another ball, and they can be running parallel to each other while you knit. 
The other yeah. is to spin them together, like a two well, ply. I, yeah, I think. Um, okay, so the issue with marling is that you're chopping up the colors of the yarns in a very fine way because the yarns are twirling on each other, and so they're the they're the colors of those yarns are really being kind of chopped together, and when they get chopped together that finely, it blends the colors through your eye and your brain in a way that that makes you see the marl the way the marl is going to be. And so here's just a little here's a little swatch I've been playing with, a little broken garter swatch. But when I say the barber pole effect, if I hold this the, the parallel to each other, you can definitely see how the colors will compare. But if you barber pole it, you're going to see I think a better idea of how they're going to blend. And then the micro swatch is just one notch better than that. Right. But right? the difference between when you hold each the two strands coming from the balls individually parallel to each other, when you knit with them some t randomly, one will be more forward than the other, and it's very random. Versus if the two colors have already been spun together, like when you twisted those together, then it's more uniform which colors you see on the fabric. So if you look at a, a marl, um, well, actually... I don't know if we can all see this there's, very there's well in the book. There's a good picture in here of it, yes. Yeah, but I talk a little bit about that. Whether the yarns have been pre-plied or not, right? You will, get, you will get that effect I call micro-pooling, where you, you will get um, one color stuck toward the front that you simply can't, you know, you just can't make it behave. You here it is right it. here. I've got it. It's on yeah, page right uh, 64. Page yeah, 64. So, one of those swatches... I'll, go, I'll put it up. Okay. One of those swatches is Wolf Oak Snow, which is a commercially marled yarn. I think it's in the middle row. It's the and middle one. And even there, you can see where the black and white will clump. And what's happening is the yarns are twirling as you knit. And they'll get sort of stuck, you know, randomly. They'll be Black will be proud for a while. Their white will be proud. Um, on the top row, on the upper left... The two balls were held separately, and on the right they were pre-plied, but they were the same yarn. And what you can see is that the effect is is reduced with pre-plying, but it doesn't really completely go away. But so, it, it's, I think it's personal preference too, what you want your fabric to look like. Well, I, it, so the the bigger the the bigger the scale becomes, the less it matters. Right. Right. So so the bigger the scale, the less it matters. But you also have to think about how many colors am I working with? And if I pre-ply the yarn, I've now kind of made it impossible to untangle those yarns again. Right. So, so it exactly. depends on there are exactly. a lot of factors here. <laughs> how much yarn you have. <laughs> yeah. Also, one of the things that you said about swatching that I find very, very true and is hard for a lot of people to get is when you're knitting a small swatch like this big, like three or four inches square, um, the edges and the cast on and the bind off become extraordinarily obvious because there's nothing to distract your eye from them. Whereas if you have a big swatch, like something like this, the edges, the fabric is what you look at. When you have a little swatch, so people will make little swatches and they'll think it looks ugly because they don't like their cast on their bind off or the edges. And they, they get distracted from what the fabric looks like. But in the reality, in a big piece, the top, the bottom, and the edges, yes, they are important, but what a person's going to see is the fabric. Well, that's true. Okay, so this is where um, I think June Hyatt kind of cracked this nut already. She has a cast-on called the Stranded Cast-on. You know, after you finish knitting, you can take the tail and just pull it through the loops. Right, so it's not that's distorting your fabric. Exactly. The Stranded Cast-on is that at the beginning. So you do that at the beginning, and then you just pull the strand through the loops at the top, and then you basically don't have a cast on or cast off at the top. Right. And so then there'll just be a little bit of side curl will be the only issue. But that's the way to do a swatch, I think, where it's really well or a gauge or swatch. A big, big swatch. Right, right. And but, notice you're not doing a garter stitch edges. <laughs> yeah. <I> mean, <laughs> so, so, sometimes I do like a. I, I did a few because I wanted the swatches to be um, sort of presentable later right, as their own little right. object. But if you're doing but normally, it for your own purposes, you don't do garter stitch edges. So I would say kind of back to engineering prototyping and back to swatching is prototyping for knitters. You know, whether it be a micro swatch or a swatch to see how a stitch pattern looks or a swatch to get gauge, they all have a different function. 
and the things that you do for those different purposes will be different. Exactly. So, so what happens is a lot of people see a swatch presented with the garter stitch border on it to make the, it's showing off the fabric, it's showing off the stitch pattern, but that's not how you would make a gauge swatch. So they misinterpret that that is a gauge swatch because garter stitch has a completely different row gauge than stockinette or any other stitch pattern inside. So you can't, you wouldn't expect a gauge swatch to have any border on it at all. It should not have no border, it should not, there should be no border because yeah. it would distort your gauge, your row gauge. So, you know, the, the, there's another thing that I think is harder these days than used to be historically in knitting, which is yarn variety. So if you roll back the clock 50 years or more, most people use the same kind of yarn over and over and over again. And gauge became something that they well understood because they'd already made, you know, 10 sweaters in that kind of yarn. They didn't right. have to go through the gauge process. Learning about gauge and how a yarn behaves is something you have to do to get to know a new yarn. Uh -huh. and, I, and I think that sometimes we make life harder on ourselves by enjoying all this variety. Exactly, exactly. It, right, people who traditionally knit garments because those were the only garments they had of that variety, they knitted with the same yarn over and over because that's the yarn they had access to, you know. And so they knew, and they knew from a child what their gauge was going to be. I mean, they've been doing it their whole life. Whereas yeah. we, when we go to the store, every sweater we make might be a different yarn. Well, and even if you think about it, if a designer is always working in a particular yarn over and over and over again, they don't, they can short circuit this learning curve because, you know, as soon as you've used a yarn for one sweater, you've right. made a huge investment. I, if you like the yarn, I highly encourage you to stick with it because uh, all that early learning is done. Right, exactly. It's a time saver. So uh, Luann writes, uh, she goes, I love learning new stuff. <laughs> People like this. Uh, Gloria Antonell says, when she worked for a weaving fiber design studio, she had access to barns full of great yarn mill ends and have mixed yarns, textures, and fibers. And she's new to knitting and find yarn choices limited in textures. Yeah, when you get to put them together yourself, it's quite different than going to a yarn store. And what happens to people, too, sometimes, especially, I like to knit my own things. Like, I, I rarely knit a, to a pattern. I have an idea of what I want to do, and I knit my own things. And sometimes patterns influence me, and I have knit many patterns. But you'll get something in your mind that you want to do, and then go try to find the yarn for it. Good luck. <laughs> you know, it's better to find the yarn. That's why I love going to big knitting conferences where you have access to all the yarn. And oftentimes I will find the yarn first and then let it tell me what it wants to be. Yeah, I do that too. Yeah. So uh, let's look at some of the rest of the pictures, okay? So this piece is called Goethe, and this is an example of a common strand marl. So in this piece, there's one strand of a charcoal colored silk noil that runs the whole way through and then there's four stripes of a very brightly colored cotton tape and both yarns are lace weight both yarns are are heavy lace weight so knit together these are i think this was knit on a size four or 3.5 millimeter needle it, it's really a, a gauze but this piece was um a really important one for me for two reasons one is i live in this hot climate and i have been really kind of exclusively working with wools and, and, and animal fibers. And I really wanted to come up with some fabrics that I thought felt good, but would be hot weather friendly. So this, this was a, a, a first example of that. And then the other thing here was just how beautifully the silk noil behaves like a, like a Northern European tweed yarn, because it, because the noil has that tweed look and how the orange and the yellow there are pure saturated bright but how the charcoal was able to tone it down. So this was one of those um, pieces that helped me learn a lot about how colors mixed and what you could achieve with different fibers. So, you know, when you're talking about um, tints and is it hues and tints or I get them confused, but where you uh, actually... I, 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 so a, a, a hue is if you have to call the color on the wheel, that's the hue. Uh-huh. 
So and then orange you, is the hue, for if example. If you add white to it, then you are getting a shade? Nope. Oh, you add white to get a tint, you add black to get a shade, and gray to get a tone. So this is a, you added gray, so it's a tone of the orange and the, the yellow. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the gray, that's, that's a nice way to think about it. If you could squint your eyes and make it blurry and imagine those colors all blended, it's like throwing some, some gray on top of the colors and toning them down. Okay, let's look at this one. This is gorgeous. Uh, and this is two scarves. There's a scarf that John is holding, and there's a scarf that John is wearing. And these are both made from Catherine Lowe's Merino 5. And her Merino 5 is a little bit of a misnomer because she used to have an old Merino that was five strands, which is what the five meant. But her new Merino is half the thickness. So these are actually both made, the yarn is 10 strands. You're carrying 10 strands when you knit. Wow. And so the, the piece that he's wearing is the most, um, I think it's the most elaborate marl bridge you can make. It goes from nine strands of white with one strand of black and then incrementally moves all the way to nine strands of black with one strand of white. So it's the smoothest gradient you can make with a marl. It's and beautiful. It, it's stunning. And if you could feel it, it feels wonderful too because her yarn is so lovely. And then the piece that he's holding is using the same yarns, but he but now it's using a striping concept to also move from dark to light, but it's just a different way to play with the yarns and work with them to create another a gradient in a different way. So it's just uh, two examples of gradients made from black and white, which are the two most extreme colors you can make a gradient from, and just showing you two different ways to do it when you have 10 strands to play with. They're just elegant, so elegant. Thank you. And this piece here is uh, a detail of the piece on the cover of the book called Castell. And this is made from, this piece was made from 15 colors, but the pattern is written for 13 colors. And the idea here is how do you work with a lot of colors? And how do you, how do you consider all the combinations of the colors? So this is all of the combinations from all of the colors worked in bias stripes using a little bit of sequence knitting. And I love watching how the colors interact and move. And it's just, um, it's just a lot of fun to, let the rule mix the colors and just just let it happen you know it's very freeing and if you want to play with a lot of color and you've ever worried about it this is a wonderful way to um just do it and let it be what it's going to be so uh, one of barty said are uh, so are there gazillions of ends to weave in no, um, when there's this much going on in the fabric, you don't really have to um, worry about keeping the stripes sharp. So what I do is when it's time to change color, you knit the first couple stitches of the new row with the old color, and then you add in the new the new yarn, and you knit a few stitches, and then you just drop the tails. Right, keep going. it's not going to show. So this would be, when I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, you know, people make those temperature blankets. Yeah. Instead of just knitting straight across and make them in garter stitch, think of making it in a mar in, in a sequence knitting. Oh yeah, or a sequence knitting, or you could marl the, it where you marled with sequence knitting. Yes. Even better. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Wouldn't that be fun? Yeah, I think those temperature blankets are brilliant, and you could have all sorts of wonderful, fun ways to play with that. So this is the last picture. So let's come back to me and you. So this has been totally fascinating. So fascinating. Um, I love talking about knitting. I could do it all day long, every day. <laughs> Me too. It's just too. Thank so you. fun. So I'm going to wrap this up, and I want to thank you so much uh, for being my interview. And I'm sorry for the rough start. Uh, oh, I apologize. I think it was on my end, perhaps. Well, the... who knows? Who knows what it was? And, you know... Even when you and you know we practiced beforehand and there were no issues, you know, it's just who knows? It's just part of being live, you know, and 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 it's just us two knitters here. I mean, I'm not a broadcast TV coordinator. Do you know what I mean? It's we're knitters, but we're trying to share, and so things happen. It's just how it is, and we are very innovative, and we got over it real quick. <laughs> So I want to thank you so much, and I hope you come back someday and be interview again, and especially after your next book. How long does it take you to write a book, by the way? 
Um, first of all, thank you. And I would be delighted to come back again. And um, this making morals took me about two years. Well, it'll be sooner than two years. It won't be two years. Maybe you can talk about the process of making a book, <laughs> you know? Um, so anyway, I want to thank you so much. This will be uh, can stay on YouTube, and I'll send you the link to it, and you can share it with your friends if you want. And um, I hope you all enjoyed meeting Cecilia. And, you know, she's... she's it, make, it makes her book so much more meaningful when you know the person who wrote them and their process and stuff. And I love both your books, and I want to thank you, and I'm going to say goodbye. Thank you very much. And Bye, happy everybody. Knitting. Happy knitting. <laughs>